remember the Bible, it's a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. That's, that's what makes the Bible such a unique, unique book in your library, doesn't it? I mean, unbeliever don't get anything out of the Bible, and we get everything out of it. In fact, it's the only Bible that, we'll, that, you know, that we have that's heaven-bound. I mean, out of all the books you got, I mean, this is the one. And so uh, finding a special place in your heart for it on a, on a daily, whether you're reading it, studying it, or applying it, I mean, how important it is. So it's a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. Can't study it in carnality. Won't work. You can't learn it in carnality, and you can't live it in carnality. The Bible will not work for you in carnality. That, that's a flesh book. The Bible is not a flesh book. It's a spiritual book. So what's the evidence of carnality in your life? Personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins. It could be sins of the tongue or overt sins. That's just three categories that we mentioned because it probably covers the majority of people, right? And so what do I do? Evidence of carnality, personal sin, what do I do? Well, the work of Christ on the cross is extended to the Christian life by confession of sin. You don't confess your sin to be saved. You come to confess your sin because you are saved. 1 John 1, 9 refers back to verse 7, the cleanse. When you hear the word cleanse in verse 9, it works off of verse 7. Listen to the word cleanse in 1, 9. Right? If we confess our sins, that, that's a third-class conditional F, by the way. It's volitional. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. But if you want the second half, if you want the then clause to the if clause, if you confess your sin then, if you want the fulfillment of the if, if you want that then, you, volitional, you have to confess your sin. When you do confess your sin, then you have the, what we call the apotheosis, then you have this. God has promised you. He is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Not just sin but all the things attached to it. Think about that. And you know what's wonderful? Hebrews, the, we saw in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 17. And you know what about the confession of sin? Listen to this. You need to listen to me. When you confess your sins, he remembers it no more. Think about that. Now, that sounds humanly impossible, doesn't it? And for, for the human arena, it is. But the things... The things that are impossible with men are possible with God, and there's one. He remembers them no more. That's a wonderful thing. And, and listen, if he won't remember them anymore, what's the idea to your life? I mean, what, he just, what has he just spoke to your heart about? Then you remember it what? No more. How about that? I mean, we spend so much time in guilt that's unnecessary. It's just fleshly guilt. Well, you know why? Because the work of Christ cleansed me from the sin. And when, my, when the blood cleanses you from sin, then God, what? He, he remember. not only does he see it no more, he remembers it no more. He remembers it no more. That, that's, that's a pretty good deal. You know that? And it's all by grace. So we're going to give you a moment this morning to, to do that very thing to pause for a moment, to bow your head, close your eyes, to step into your private space of your altar with God, confess your sin if necessary, uh, tell him how thankful you are for the cleansing work of Christ on the cross that takes care of the cleansing of your sin and the fact that when it works, God remembers it no more and you're going to apply that to your life. Wouldn't that be a new day? Wouldn't that be a fresh day in your life to know that? And so, our Father, we thank you for these that have come our way to study with us this morning in James chapter 1, verse 25, the perfect law of liberty. When we come to understand that, that will be, you talk about freedom, the word liberty, the word liberty, mm, that's all about the application of freedom in our life. Liberty, liberty, the freedoms that we have in Christ, the freedoms. We spend so much time in bondage as Christians. And we shouldn't because it was for cre freedom. It was for liberty that Christ set us free. It was for liberty. It was for freedom that Christ 
set us free. So our Father, we pray we would get that message today deep and within our soul that we might be a, a functional Christian with peace in our soul. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, notice in, in chapter 2, my first, my first idea to you, in chapter 2, James has been addressing a problem. Now, we're really in James 2, but I picked up off from James 1. But James, the book of James and the book of Hebrews should go together. They're both, they're both uh, warning uh, Jewish believers about not going back to the law. Don't go back to the bondage system. Don't go back to the, the, the law was not designed to save you. It was designed to point to Christ who saves you. It was never intended. Don't go back to the law. Don't ever go back to the law for any reason. And so they're both writing on this subject matter, and we've been covering both these books so in conjunction. So James is addressing the problem, chapter 2. You remember that in chapter 2, there were visitors coming into the Christian church in Jerusalem and being mistreated as respecter of persons. The ushers that were bringing them in and setting them uh, we're doing it based on partialities as a respecter of persons. And uh, they were treating the wealthy and uh, different types of people by respecter of persons. They were treating them differently than just the average guy who come in. For example, if you were wealthy and you had the appearance of being wealthy, then you got a special seat, and if you wasn't, then they put you on the floor or set you at, they gave you the bad seats. Even though there were good seats, they gave you the bad seat. And so they, they had a lot of problems in the Christian church like we do today. Paul picked this up in the book of Galatians in the third chapter, and he said that in Christ, we are one in Christ. Therefore, there are no more racial boundaries, no more social boundaries, no more educational boundaries, no more boundaries, no gender gaps. None of these gaps are anymore. We are one in Christ. We're no longer male and female. We're no longer free and slave, etc. You know, you know it. And um, these social issues we, we battle with in every generation, but... It shouldn't be done in the church. And so James is addressing this issue in James, the second chapter, and he, call, and he brings up in verse 12 uh, the, the law of liberty, just like in chapter 1, verse 21. He brings that law. So he's addressing problems. And listen, he's addressing problems. And listen, we all got problems. You live in the devil's world with flesh. <laughs> You got a sin nature, you got it at birth, and you'll have it till death. We all got problems. It's how we solve them. I mean, problems are a good thing. They're not a bad thing. It's how we solve them. It's how we resolve them. It's how we, it's how we view them. It's how we think about them and how we inspire. Listen, if you got a problem, it has to be solved spiritually. If it's going to be solved spiritually, you're going to have to go to the Word of God. Because there's two things that's got to be, it's got to work to solve fleshly problems spiritually. It takes the Word of God so that faith can work, not sight. And you got to walk in the Spirit so it can be done in the Spirit, not the flesh. Those two things have to work. So in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, it says, uh, 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 you walk by faith, not by sight. In Galatians 5, 16, it says, you walk, in this, you walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. And, and there, there's, how you, there's how you resolve things. That's how you think about things in your life. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a big deal to have problems. It's, it's how you're dealing with them, right? If you, have to, if you have to medicate yourself to solve your problems, well, we, we got a flesh problem going. I mean, the two things that God has given us, and James is trying to tell us that. James is trying to tell us. He, I mean, the whole, the whole new covenant is about how we resolve issues in our life. How do we resolve them? 
you can't do it by sight. You have to do it by faith. You can't do it in the flesh. You have to do it by the Spirit. If you get those two things down, everything else moves pretty smooth. If you get those two things wrong, then everything compounds. All your problems compound. So James, just like other New Testament teachers, this is what he's doing. In James, the second chapter, verses 1 through 13, he's dealing with this problem of partiality where we hold people uh, with, co with colored views, with shaded glasses, sight, with all kinds of social mores, gender gaps, social gaps, educational gaps, uh, wealthy gap, all these kind of things. And so he's addressing those problems. So what I did is I broke it down in two studies. He calls it in the first eight verses, notice, I put down, he calls it the sin of partiality. And the reason he said it, because a lot of the Jews went back to the, went back, they, listen, they were born again by the gospel and went to the law to solve problems. The law was never designed to solve problems. The law was designed to create problems to point you to Christ who could solve them. And so he shows them that the sin of partiality, which was really low on their radar, was equal with murder and adultery under the law. If you put your, and so in the verse 10 of the second chapter, he says, if you put yourself under the law and commit the, what you consider the least violation of the law, you're guilty of the whole kit and caboodle. Now think about that. We did a study on the rich young ruler and Jesus put him to the test of the big tent on the man side. He got five out of six right and flunked the course. Think about that. He got 83% and flunked the whole course. Not the test, the whole course. Law is a tough place to be. Why would you put yourself under law? Under no condition. Listen, if you put yourself under law in one state, once you put yourself under the law, I don't care what it, I don't care if it's tithing or whatever it is, once you put yourself under it, you've put yourself under the whole law. To violate one, James, James 2.10, to violate one point is guilty of it all. That's tough. Why would you want to do that when Christ has come to set you free? Why would you put yourself back under that kind of bondage? When you already, it's only going to point you to Christ. You've already found him. Why are you going to go back? That's crazy. But listen, the early church was doing it, and the latter church is doing it. By latter, I mean us. And we... We got to quit that. So in James, the second chapter, 9 through 13, he calls it the law of transgressor. When you put yourself under the law, you violate one little aspect of it. You're guilty of it all. He calls it the law of transgressor. We are currently studying the 9 through 13 passage, and I pause for a moment to go back to James 125 in a review that I think is very important for my study. And so you're going to have to be patient with me on this. In the first hour, I'm going to do a study out of James 125. In the second hour, I'm going to come back, and I'm going to do a study out of James 2.12. And, and watch the difference. Look on your paper and look at the difference. In my first hour, we're going to study the perfect law of liberty out of James 125. In the second hour... James 2.12, we're going to study the law of perfect liberty. Do you see the difference? It's very important you see that difference. Very, very important you see the difference. Okay? The difference is what perfect is emphasizing. Do you see that? The perfect law of liberty or the law of perfect liberty? See, there's a difference. It's where the emphasis of perfect is. Now, in James 1, 125, I want to show you something in the Greek that's going to help us because they're markers. It's going to set up three things that are really important to James' discussion on the perfect law of liberty. Here's what James says. This is our first service deal. Watch for three things. He says, but the one who looks intently, notice that's an aorist participle. That's an A-A-P-T-C. That's an aorist active participle, not a singular masculine. Okay? And notice the hole on the front of it. 
That's not getting you ready for Christmas. This is not ho, ho, ho. That's a definite article. The one who looks intently. See, that's a participle. That's an articulate participle. The one who, the one who, that's the definite article. The one who looks intently, aorist participle, at the perfect law, by that he means the law of liberty, the perfect law of liberty, and this word, this little chi here is important. It's called an adjunctive of verbs. Whatever verb is front, that's a trailer hitch. This is piggybacking. That verb here and the next verb are connected. That's an adjunctive in the Greek, and that's very important. Why is that important? Because we can see they're sequenced. They're piggybacking. You know, you drove down the road and you see UPS with two. The one truck's carrying two trailers. They call it piggybacking. I, I didn't know if you knew. Okay, I just want to be sure. Otherwise, an illustration doesn't work, right? If you think we're farming, then we got a problem. The one who looks intently at the, at the perfect law of liberty and piggybacking and abides by it, heiress participle. See that heiress participle? You got A-A-P-T-C. Come on. And abides by it. Now he's going to give us a third heiress participle, a negative. Now he's given us two positives and now a negative. And this negative, this negative is important because you got two positives, one negative take, takes them out. You've got, an, you've got a truck carrying two piggy bags. If the truck gets in a wreck, you, you could lose both piggies. That piggy went to the market, and the other, you know, you know how it goes. All right, so look, here, the one who looks intently at the law, at the perfect law of liberty, not the law, but the perfect law of liberty, and abides by it. Now watch the negative. Not having, see, that's ook. Not having gidomai, eris middle participle. That's because it's a deponent verb. It ends in O-M-I. But it works as a historical eris. Not having become a forgetful hearer of the first two participles. Come on now. I, you got, I told you, you got to put your thinking cap on. Not having become a forgetful hearer, but effectual doer. See, the whole point of the piggy bank was to get him to the market. See, uh, who looks intently at the perfect law of liberty and abides by it, this person is not a forgetful here. This person is an effectual doer. That's the whole purpose. Let's get the piggy to the market. <laughs> yeah. If nobody else liked it, my wife did, and that's what's important. <laughs> That's exactly what's important, all right? Because she understands the goofy humor I have. But an effectual doer, now watch the plus. Here's the marketplace. Get, let's get it to the marketplace. Let's get it to the marketplace, which is hearing the word of God and doing it, learning it and living it. Are you with me? Now, here, here's the bonus. Here is the profit we get from the big sale at the marketplace. This man is blessed, now watch this, in what he does. Blessed. You know, I mean, you know what blessed is? See, you were just hoping just to get a little above, above margin. If I could just get cost plus 30, that'd be a good, that'd be good, wouldn't that? I think the average, average guy, business guy out there would go to that. But here's, here's, here's what blessed is. 100 full, 60 full, 30 full, right? Even though you expect 30, it's up to God. God may give you 60. You say, wow, I don't know what. And they go, you know, a knock at the door uh, next week and says, hey, you know that 30 you got? Here's a bunch of needs and a bunch of ministry. Or a hundredfold. I mean, when God gives it to you, it, you're to spread it around, aren't you? There are people, there are people now that you, you can touch their lives with, uh, with, uh, with the name of Jesus Christ by your gifts in his name. You know, you know who the guy, he's not looking for all of that, blessed. 
I mean, he was just, he's just learning the word of God to live it, to get from day one to day two with his head above water. <laughs> and when he gets it done, God gives him 100 full, 60 full, or 30. The least of it is 30. That's 30 above cost, man. But God is good. It's not God. God is good. God is good all the time. Not just once in a while. God is good all the time, isn't he? And that's, that's what James is talking about in verse 25. That's exactly what he's talking about. And he, and he says, listen, you need to know the doctrine of the perfect law of what? Liberty. Liberty is understanding what God's freedom under grace brings into your life. Do you know what 100 fold, 60 fold, and 30 fold is? That's, the, that's abundant grace. That's not meeting your needs. See, 30% is not needs. That's profit. 60 full, is, you know, 100 full, that's so far out there, 100 full. And listen, 100 full, 60 full, and 30 full is so far above needs. Oh, God, you know, God says, I'll take care of your needs. Listen. If you learned to live the word of God and it becomes a, content, a continuity in your life, a consistency, you step into a blessed man or person per circle of influence where God will not only meet your needs, that's the least. He will move you into 100-fold, 60-fold, and 30-fold, and you will wonder, what am I going to do with all this? And he's going to say, well, thanks for asking. See, most of us, we just live, oh, God, will you take care of my needs? And he wants you to be in the 100-fold, 60-fold, and 30-fold. But you're not going to get there if you don't learn the principle that on a daily basis, on a daily basis, you have to be learning and applying the word of God. 2 Corinthians, Second uh, Timothy, third chapter, verse 16 calls it all scripture is inspired. All scripture is God-breathed and profitable. And he's talking about inhale, exhale. He's talking about learning and living. That's what he's talking about. Second, I know, it's not on your paper. Second Timothy, third chapter, 16, 17. Great verse. All scripture is inspired. Or in the King James, he says it right. All scripture is God-breathed. You know, breathing is inhale, exhale, isn't it? You take the word of God in, you apply it. And that's the secret of this whole thing about being blessed. That's the whole secret. That's what James is saying. You must tap into the doctrine of the perfect law of liberty. So we're going to talk about three things in this uh, in our first hour this morning. You know what blessed is? I told you what blessed is. But here's another one. I just, 100 fold, 60 fold, and 30 fold, that's blessed. Would you agree with that? Is, is that above a need? 30% is above a need, man. That's profit. Yeah, that's more than the seed got back. We got stuff to sell. That little farm boy. So, listen, we, if we got our seed back, we considered a, a victory. But when you can take stuff to the, I, when you could buy a, a new plow or a new disc or a new drag out of some of that profit, you want like, or a new cow. <laughs> I mean, whoa. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, I don't have no city examples. Uh, so I don't know what that means. Maybe shooting rats or something. I don't know what this is. I don't have a, I don't have a frame of reference for cities, so I, I can't go there. But blessed, listen, not only 100, but, but here's my point, 100-fold, 60-fold, 30-fold, that's with our feet on earth. That's, that's because God is going to bless us, and he's going to bless us so that we can bless others. We can meet the needs of other people. 
I guarantee you, we even know a lot of people have needs. Okay. Write this down. Write this somewhere on your paper. 1 Corinthians 3rd chapter, 10 through 15. You know what it says? Everything that God blesses in time, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm speaking like a Yankee right now. I'm going fast, ain't I? 1 Corinthians, I, I do, I, my engine gets started and then I, I fall back to speaking talk fast. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. Okay. You know what that says? If you're a blessed man in time, you'll be a blessed man in eternity because there he set, you set up treasures and rewards in heaven, right? And he's talking about the judgment seat of Christ when you will be given rewards and honors. When, it, when you're blessed on earth, you're laying up treasures for yourself in heaven. And you'll be a blessed man there. What, what is you're blessed here is automatically transferred there. Laying up for yourself treasures in heaven. That's pretty. So most of the Christians that understood this principle, they, they didn't care about how, their money here. They cared about it. They didn't care what all it got here. They cared about what all it got there. <laughs> and at some point, you'll reach that in your life before you die if you stay spiritual. And it will be the most rewarding experience of your life. And God will just use you to channel stuff. I found he wanted to do it. When I didn't have money, I had things. I had things. A car. Furniture. I had a, I had a power saw. <laughs> Used it one or two times. <laughs> I had to have one. I'm a man. <laughs> Gotta have a power saw. Gave that stuff away. Some were hard, harder than others. But I saw a need. It wasn't a financial need that I could meet. I didn't have any need to do it, but I had things. I had things that people needed that I didn't. Do you know about that? See, it's not always about. It depends on what the hundredfold is. We very seldom, we got hundredfolds of stuff on the farm or 60. It never was money. At least I never saw it. It was grain. We stored grain. We, strained, we did corn. We did this and that and processed it over the year. Uh, I'm using the word blessed. Are, are we blessed? Listen, we're in a position to be blessed. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, that's the gospel. When you believe it, you're in. Listen, if you want to be blessed, learn how to live, to, learn, how, learn how to live it. Learn it to live it, and you'll be a blessed man. Is that not what he says? The perfect law of liberty, having the freedom in Christ to receive the blessings, I'm blessed, and to be able to give it out. I'm blessed again because now I've laid up treasures in my, for myself in heaven. When I get there, I say, well, Ron gave a <laughs> saw and he gave a car and he gave this and he gave that. And I go like, I don't remember doing that. See, I can remember some things. See, I don't know what you think a hundredfold in that, but hopefully we've transferred it over to another idea in your mind. Point one, this is the first time James has mentioned the law of liberty. That's James 1.25. He will actually teach it three times. He will teach it in tw James 1.25. Listen, he does it in 2.8 by calling this concept the, the royal law of love. Because, listen, this whole thing, when what flows in flows out, we don't want to be the Dead Sea, do we? We want what, what blessings God flows in, we want it to flow out. 
And you know why it flows out? It flows out because we're in a relationship with God. We know, we know who he is, and he knows who we are, and we want to be like him. Do you not want to be like Christ? I do. I do. It's hard for me to think I could be like God because I never knew him in the flesh, but I know God in the flesh in the name of Jesus Christ because he gave me a life example as well as a word example. See, I used to pack up stuff, a bag. If, if I didn't wear something within a year or two, I packaged it up, and I would give it to Goodwill and all that kind of stuff. And, and I, w I, I, I had a bag of clothes. I was headed down to drop it off like, you know, probably like you do. And the Holy Spirit said in my heart, who are you giving it to? I said, well, I'm just, well, I'm going to give it to such and such an organization. He said, that's not what I said. I said, who are you giving it to? And I said, you must not have understood me. I'm giving it to such and such an organization. Well, the Spirit says, how are you going to do that? I said, well, I'm going to drive up. I'm going to pick it out of my car. I'm going to throw it in a bin and drive off. He said, that's not why I gave you that bag of clothes. If you want to drop it off, you take it inside, and you, tell, you talk to the people about the gospel of Jesus Christ, or don't drop that bag off. How about that? I went, why? It's just, it's going to go to good things. What's the deal here? I, he said, well, here's the deal. It's not a spiritual bag. Oh, well, I think we're just picking at stuff here now. I mean, <laughs> no, no, no. When it comes from you, Ron Adama, it's a spiritual bag. I didn't give you that to put it in a bag and throw it in a, something to drive off like, well, I've done my good thing. Uh-uh, you haven't done anything. In the name of Jesus Christ, that goes from you to them in the name of Jesus Christ. That's a spiritual bag. If they want those clothes, they got to listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I said, well, you know, they don't open inside till 9. You know, I've got, I've got a busy life. He said, well, carry that in your car until you get out of your busy life, but don't put that off. And, you know, I couldn't do that. I could not put that back. I went like, you're probably talking to another spirit. Yeah, right, the devil. Like, yeah, right, I'm talking to the devil. See, that's the kind of conversations you have in dinner dialogue. Go throw the thing if, don't take that back home. Well, he said, don't take it. I don't care where you take it, but don't drop it here. Don't drop it here. Yeah, I left it in my car until I just got tired of carrying it around. And I went, okay. Okay. See, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a blessed man. Why am I a blessed man? Because I've been faithful? No, it's beyond that. Because when I am blessed here, I am blessed there by association with that blessing here. And there's more attached here while well, my feet are on earth to that little bag of something or that little power saw or that car, whatever it is. It's a transfer of blessings from one to a, it's a tr There's a transfer and needs to be spiritual. That's my point. In James 1.25, we've looked at three heirs participles. Here's the secret. Know that, see that little circle? Going clockwise. See that little, down there, the hearer, the receiver, the applier, the completing? That goes clockwise. That's called the faith cycle. This is how the dynamics of the Word of God lives in your life. See the line that goes through that? You got hearing and believing on one side. You know what that is? That's the learning side. That's the learning side. See the other side where it says applying and completing? That's the living side. You need to learn that little faith cycle. That's what James is talking about. 
And it's when you go from learning to living that you become a blessed person. You now have stepped into a position of spiritual growth, of, of faithfulness to the Word of God, where God can actually begin to supply information through you, to, supply, to put supplies and needs through you. There are a lot of things when you step into this atmosphere, this sphere of influence, that God begins as a blessed person. God begins to fu funnel all kinds of things through you, information as well as things. It's an amazing Thing. It is not going to happen if you don't get into the faith cycle of spiritual growth maturity. That 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. It's not going to happen. On this side, he says, look intently. Hearing and believing is look intently. What am I looking intently? Into the perfect law of liberty. I'm looking intently. You know what that is? Intently. I mean, that's... that's Now, all my illustrations going through my head are farm things. I just opened a cow's mouth. I just opened a horse's mouth and looked at his teeth. I, but why should I use that illustration? Who, who cares in this congregation? But all my illustrations are farm illustrations. I'm going to skip it. I mean, you just have to understand. This, this side is the planning side. Listen, look at, I'm in, first, uh, I'm in uh, James 121. I just, I just slid into James 121. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness in hum watch this, in humility, that's grace orientation to why I should learn. Listen, when you, listen, the reason you should learn to live the word of God is because you need to become so grace oriented how that cycle works. Humility is learning the cycle of God, how God's grace works in our life through learning the Bible and then applying it to our life. Humility. In humility, receive the word. Watch this. In humility, receive the word implanted. You know, we, we would go out, we would, we would plant something when we, you know, we put three seeds in it or a quarter of a potato. And we moved to the second one. When you move to the second one, the first one was what? Implanted. It was put in the ground at a proper depth uh, and ready now for a growth process. Do you understand that? That's the word implanted. When he talks about the parable of the sower and he goes through that, he, he, he constantly talks about once it's planted, what has to happen. It has to take roots. If it, gets, if it doesn't have a rooting system, it'll die. If it doesn't have the proper uh, nourishment, it will die, yada, yada, yada. The good ground, you see, the good ground. But a whole thing is about planting seed. The whole thing about the parable of the sower is about the sower and the seed. <laughs> Without that, it don't matter what kind of ground you got. Because we're not looking to have any kind of a crop. <laughs> All right. So look intently is the hearing and the believing side of this. This is the learning side. This is the planning side. In James, listen to James 121. In humility, that's the good ground, grace orientation, receive the word implanted for spiritual growth, which is what? Able to deliver your soul. Isn't that interesting? It's able to deliver your soul. The word of God that's implanted, that's, that's been planted in a way so you're looking to God's grace to bring a harvest, to bring a crop at a harvest. I tell you, so far, you've got your money's worth. I've given you every bit of your money's worth of this one. If you learn nothing else today from me, you got your money's worth. I don't care if you put a penny in the offering. You got your money's worth. Look intently at the perfect law. What side does that go on? The right side. Okay. And abides by it, 
That goes on the left side. That goes on the side of applying and doing, uh, applying and completing. Look, he must not become a forgetful hearer. That goes on the right side. Are you with me? But he should become a what? Effectual, ineffective, a productive doer. That goes on the left side. You got all that on your paper? Yeah, that's probably a gate question. This will be a gate question for sure. Do you know Ron's little diagram? Okay, here it is. You go, I know I should have paid attention when I was in class. And what is the, what is the big deal? This man, this person, this one will be what? Take that to the bank. Take that to the bank. Point two, the perfect law of liberty. I cannot work to bring you into God's grace blessings. Only faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ can do that. Now, that's, that's important because a lot of people get in the law and think they're going to get blessed by it, saved by it, blessed by it. And yet it's not true. It's not designed to do that. It's, it's, it's Galatians 3.24. It's designed to point you to Christ who can do it all. And that's, that's what's important. The law was not designed spiritually to do that. It was designed spiritually to point you to Christ who can do it all and not only do it all. Listen, you know the wonderful thing about salvation, what Christ did on the cross works continuously for you in time and eternity. You know, the writer of Hebrews, really, we're, on Tuesday nights and Wednesdays, we're covering uh, uh, Hebrews 8, 9, and 10, the doctrines of the new covenant, which, sadly enough, are not taught well enough to the church of the new covenant. <laughs> You would think of all the doctrines, it would certainly be that, and they're not. But So we're back to some basic things to try to explain to our people. And um, the law was never designed. It was never divinely designed. It was designed to point you to Christ who can fulfill it. And Hebrews says he dies one death for all time. You know, we, we miss those little phrases. He dies one death for all sin for all time. In other words, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, I quote it all the time, but verse 10 says that. Verse 10 says it. See, verse 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We, we are his workmanship in verse 10. Created in Christ Jesus. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. We are. We are his continuous workmanship. Salvation is something that's received and continuously processes itself throughout time and eternity, right? And I think sometimes we forget that. Uh, we forget the processing of that wonderful thing. Uh, Bob used to, Bob theme used to break that thing down and he would call it phase one, two, and three. Salvation, the Christian life in eternity. He, he would break it down in three parts to make sure you understood salvation is is a pr 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 process that goes on in time and eternity. I mean, just think, you're going to still be growing and glowing in uh, eternity. Just think about that. That's a pretty amazing idea. Uh, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And um, a lot of that workmanship is hindered because we're in the devil's world and we're flesh, right? Uh, we have volition and all that kind of thing. But it's, a, it's amazing to me <laughs> the awesomeness of what God in his grace has provided for the new covenant church, for, for the new covenant church. I mean, we are so adequately equipped for everything that passes through our life. Think about that. I mean, we get so caught up, sometimes we go through Bad relationships, bad business deals, bad this, bad, this, bad that. And they truly are bad in a sense. But not in the eyes of God and shouldn't be in yours. There's no such thing as bad. 
that's a worldly term. I mean, God is good, and he's good all the time, right? He's good, and he's good all the time. And we, we often speak words into our life that aren't true to the word of God. That inner dialogue can be a mess sometimes. We speak things. I was with a guy the other day, and he kept referring to himself with negative terms. And I was in my office, and so I, I was writing. Every once in a while, I'd write a word down on my napkin. And finally, after about five or six words, he stopped and he said, what are you writing? I said, I'm writing your diary. He said, you're writing my diary? I went, yes. He said, well, what do you think? And I, think, I said, I think you're full of negativity. You're speaking bad words to your life that aren't true. You're speaking words into your life that aren't true. I said, and so I started going down the list. What, is this, what does this mean to you? And he told me, and I said, that's not what it means. That is not what that word means. If you went to the English dictionary... That's not what that word means. You, you've, 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 you've colored it black. You've taken a good word and colored it black. You know, you always pay attention when people color words, right, or color pictures. And, and, and so we talked about, I had five words on, on, a piece, on a piece of paper out of his diary, not mine. They didn't come out of my mouth. They came out of his. And I said, it's no wonder you're depressed. I'd be depressed if I had those words in my life. Those are depressing words. <laughs> so here, here we are in, the, in, in point number two, the perfect law of liberty cannot, cannot the perfect law, if, if you're looking, talking about the law, the perfect law of liberty, what is this perfect law? That the perfect, a perfect law can't bring you any place into the spiritual kingdom. A perfect law. But the perfect law of liberty focuses on Jesus Christ. See, when James called it, he didn't call it the perfect law. He called it the perfect law of liberty. <laughs> Listen, that's an oxymoron in Jewish thinking. Because the law is bondage, right? The perfect law of liberty. He does it deliberately. How does, a, how does a, there's no perfect law of liberty in the true sense of the Mosaic law. Only unless it's in Jesus Christ. Now listen to this. Jesus Christ was the only person to keep the whole old covenant law perfectly. Only person. And that's because he was God in the flesh. <laughs> If it hadn't been God in the flesh, he could have done it. Because it was never designed. It was designed to point people to him. When he came, he had to be that perfect example, didn't he? Listen to what he says in Matthew 5, 17. He says, I did. Do you think that I came into the world to abolish the law or the prophets? The old covenant. I didn't come to abolish. I came to fulfill. You know what that word is? Teleos. I came to complete, I came to fulfill, I came to finish. I brought it to an end. I brought it to a goal. I brought it to a creative, intentional goal is what teleos means. You know what happened to those listening to that? Look, look up here. You know what that means? When I take my hand and go, right? We used to say it went in one ear and what? Just in case you wonder why you were a bad student at some point in your life, don't mean you always have to be, does it? That's a wonderful thing. Dude, listen, listen to Romans 10.4. Paul says, Christ is the end. Tell us. He's the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. To everyone who believes. In verse 17 of that same chapter, he's going to say, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Now, how do you get faith? Huh? Put your hand in the Bible and repeat after me. No. 
Man, if that would be that good, we'd all be there, wouldn't we? I'd have your hand in that Bible every time we met. Every time I saw you, get your Bible and put your hand out. Repeat after me. That's not how it comes. I mean, he's got to go through that faith cycle, man. There, there's a hearing side and a doing side. You got to understand how they work in conjunction. Listen, to, I love this one. I look, you know, this is a passage that people overlook. You should go back and study this. This is a passage that's got so much theology in it, people miss it. It is uh, Jesus talking with the two guys on the road to Emmaus, you remember, after his resurrection. What he tells those guys, you should read every day. It is so good. It is so good. I wrote down the bigger passage that maybe I could tease you to read this week, verses 40 through, 44 through 53. Listen to what 44 says. He says to him, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. Now, what's he mean by that? Because he's still with him, right? What did he mean by that? I spoke these words with you when I was with you. Well, Lord, you're still with me. What does he mean by that? He meant when I was with you before I died on the cross, was buried and raised from the dead. When I was, before I fulfilled the scriptures that spoke of me in the, in the words of the prophet. Do you understand? You see, who's standing before them today is the guy who fulfilled that he would go to the cross and die on it for our sins, be buried and raised from the dead. He is the guy in a resurrected body who is about to ascend from them back to the Father. Do you see what he just said to him? Oh, you know, one might say to me, well, Ron, you would have to have been there to get it. I got it, and I wasn't there because I know what he just said. You know, people all the time go, well, Ron, I wish you knew, but you have, and I wouldn't wish this on you, Ron, but you haven't gone through what I've gone through. Hey, I don't have to go through it to know that the word of God is the one that can bring you through it. I don't have to go through your experiences to know that the word of God is true. You don't have experience the word of God to know it's true. It's true. It's true because it's in the Bible. You got to take the word of God, the Bible, and put it into truth in your life. Jesus said, if you know the truth, it'll do what? Set you free. Is that what we're talking about today? You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's, and that's the truth. <laughs> and that's the truth. These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. See, a lot of people miss that, don't they, Al? Don't pay any attention to it. That all things which are written about me in the law of the Moses, the prophet, and the Psalms. You know what that three things are? That's the entire Old Testament. He just broke it down into Jewish thinking. That's the three sections. That's how they talked about it. The entire Old Covenant. There it is. The Old Testament. Listen, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses, the prophet, that, listen, must be fulfilled. When he gets through, he's going to salute him and said, I'll see you in the next life. Da -da -da! He's going to send back to the Father, and they're going to watch him go up. And they're going to say, the angel's going to come back and preach a sermon and say, as you see them go up, you will see them come back. Isn't that good? Now, you ain't got an angel preaching to you today. There's no country boy. Saved by grace. There's no country boy. Chapter 3. In a lesson at point 3. In, less, in chapter 2, James warned the Christians of Jerusalem who were still holding on to the old covenant law system. He, gives, he issues a warning to them. I love the way he lays this out. In a moment, I'm going to share with you his warning and how he lays it out. 
Al will love the way he laid this out because he, he laid it out like a good counselor. Jesus was a master at it. Like when he gave a parable, you know, he, he always touched common sense and then took you to Scripture. Because if you don't have common sense, apparently when the Scripture comes along, you're just like, Pfft. So, so it's important how he did this. It's really important how he did this. They are attempting, here's what was happening in James's church. They were attempting to combine old covenant law works, combine them with new covenant faith grace. Let me tell you, that does not work. It nullifies grace, faith works. This is Galatians 2.21. It does not work. Okay, for the Christian life. The book of Hebrews gives five warnings on this very subject. Remember that? I laid those out to you the other night. I laid these five warnings. And see, people don't. They just pick and choose what they want to read. Listen, you look uh, the book of Hebrews in the first 12 chapters, the, the thir just the, the book. The th only 13, so the book. He spaces five warnings not to go back to the law and how bad it will be if you do. Because the fifth, the book of Hebrews written in 64, and they're gonna, the Jews are going to go under the fifth cycle in six years. He, he warns them, don't go back because it'll be terrible. And then he warns, he warns them to leave Jerusalem, get out of Dodge because it's going to be bad. Go, go on the mission field. Take the gospel and carry it someplace, but get out of here. And so the writer of Hebrews lays out five warnings. He spaces them, chapter 2, chapters 3, 4, chapters 5, 6, 10, and 12. They're, that's the dynamite. That's the dynamite of the book of Hebrews. And you ought to see, when you see the warning... Chapters 1 and 2. Next warning, chapters 3 and 4. Next warning, you know what I mean? It, it goes, that's the book of Hebrews. Well, anyhow, it, it's a great study. It would be well worth your time. The book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews and the book of James go right together on this warning. James warned them of the old covenant law of transgressor. In the second chapter, 9 through 13, with verse 10 declaring, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, remember the word point's not there, it's in one, has become guilty of all. That's the big point. One verse is all. I mean, that's not a good deal. I mean, who would take that deal? <laughs> I mean, you'd have to be nuts. That's not a good deal. Now, watch how James does this. Watch how James lays this out. James warns them that they are guilty of violating four laws when you go back to the law. Now, I want you to watch this. Uh, so I want you to go with Galatians because I'm, I'm about to wrap this one up. So let's go to Galatians a moment. Well, we still have enough time. Galatians, the second chapter, watch. He gives them the law of common sense. And he's telling them, do not go back. So he, the first thing he does, he gives them the law of common sense. I'm in verse 6 and 7. I'm in James 2, 6, 7. Uh, I'm sorry? Galatians. I mean Galatians. Galatians. What did I say? I said James, didn't I? Well, um, but, but to tell you the truth, I don't want Galatians. <laughs> I really don't want, I, I want, I want James. I don't want Galatians. I, don't, I want James. I want to show you what he, I don't, where, where did I get Galatians? I got James on my paper. Uh, uh, I know, I heard that. I heard that. I, I thought you would break out in a song, Happy Birthday, Ron. I thought that, was, I thought for sure that's where that was going. Um. It's called a senior moment. 
uh, here, look at James 2, uh, uh, look at 2 and 7. The first one he gives the common sense. James 2, <laughs> James 2. But you have dishonored the poor man. You have dishonored, you have dishonored the poor man. Remember the ushers? It is not the rich who oppose you. It, is it not the rich who oppose you and personally drag you into court? Question. Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you are called? Question. So that's common sense. I mean, common sense ought to tell you, why would you go back to a group of people like, oh, these are my buddies. Yeah, look at what they're doing to you. Right? Common sense would say, that's, don't do that. Then the second one he gets to is in verse 8, and he lays down the royal law of love out of, out of uh, Leviticus 19, 18. If however you are fulfilling, however, see, if you're fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you will love your neighbor as yourself. That's a royal, the royal law. That's the law of love. That law will never work in your life apart from Christ and the law of love that's operated by the Holy Spirit because can't be, that can't be done in the flesh. Not the royal law. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Then he goes to the law of transgressor. Let me show you. And he, and he, he puts it under the sin of partiality. If you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. Then he tells you why. For whoever keeps the whole law and stumbles in one, he's become guilty of all. Then he illustrates it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit mur adultery, but commit murder, you have become a transgressor of law. Of what law? The whole law. Huh? If you break one, you're guilty of them all. That's tough. I wouldn't want to be under that system at all. I would have got out of, I would have got out, I would have got out of kindergarten. Let alone the eighth grade. <laughs> I would have got out of kindergarten. Now, it, it, so, and then verse 12, which I'm going to talk about Tuesday night. Is the law of perfect the law of perfect the law of perfect liberty, which I'm going to talk about. What now here's the big one. So speak and so act as though do, doers, as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. You don't want to be under the law of Moses. You don't want to be under the law of works. You want to be under the law of freedom. Freedom. Now, where's that freedom come from? Watch this. Here's my closing one. This is my closing one. This, this for sure. This is Galatians. Somewhere in Galatians. Five. Watch five one. Five one and thirteen. But I'm going to read five, and then we're going to go home. Not to my. We're we're not all going to my home now. Okay. We'll all, we'll all go to Sam's. We'll be over to Sam's house. See, Sam's don't care. I love that. See, I didn't want you at my house, but Sam said, what do I care? More the merrier. Just bring something. Listen, he says, it was. That's not really in the original. No verb there. It says, for freedom, Christ set us free. Actually, what it says is Christ set us free for freedom. Actually, what that, what that actually says is Christ set us free for freedom. He set us free for freedom. Christ set us free for freedom. To live in freedom. To be free people. Not in bondage of anything. Not to be bondage of our flesh. Not to be bondage of the world. Not to be in bondage of the law. We're not bondage people. We've been freed for freedom. We've been freed for freedom. That's actually what that says. In your Greek text, if you read your Greek text, it's exactly what it says. For freedom, and Christ set us free. Christ set us free for freedom. Therefore, keep standing firm. That's a command. 
and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. That's a command. Then he explains what he means. He talks about circumcision or the Mosaic law. That's, that's pretty powerful. That's pretty powerful. The perfect law of liberty is based on spiritual freedom that comes through Christ. Christ has set us free for what? Thank you. Thank you. There's a man who wants to go home. <laughs> and we are. So, our Father, we thank you today for those who have visited with us, studied with us, both by automobile, in the General Assembly, and in the Universal Assembly, uh, by the Internet. We pray, Father, once again, for those who have visited us, whether at Internet, they will pick us up on a regular study. None of this hit and miss. A regular study, a regular diet of the Word of God with us. Stay with me for a year. Your life, because of the work of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, your life will never be the same and you will know it. And I pray for that, Father. I pray it for our church. I pray it for those on the Internet that they may go forth and have great ministries both to their own life and their life to others. In Jesus' name, amen.